Okay, we continue with session number three, focusing on the question of sustainable uh, development of neighborhoods, refurbishment, also conversion projects. Uh, I have been asked to remind you that when speaking from the audience to stand up so that the cameraman can better get you on his picture. So, so please and just stand up and turn around when speaking from the audience. Also when presenting the, um, the program, I forgot to, to mention that we have a final presentation and an evening lecture uh, at six o'clock by Lise Peterson from Copenhagen. So don't miss that. Stay with us until seven o'clock. Um, so that you don't miss the, the presentation from Copenhagen. But now we go into um, our session three. We start with Berlin, with the Schumacher Quartier, which is one part of the redevelopment project uh, of Tegel Airport. And we are happy that we have um, Mr. Wimmer, Simon Wimmer, with us again in, uh, in an online contribution from the Tegel Project GmbH, which is the state-owned company uh, in charge of developing uh, the former Tegel Airport area. So, Mr. Wimmer, uh, I hope you can hear us, and the floor is yours. Ausgezeichnet. Uh, Sie hören mich? Ja, wunderbar. Super, klasse. I wish you a good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Simon Wimmer. I'm an architect, and today I'm representing Gudrun Sakis, who is unfortunately ill, but sends you her warmest regards. It is a pleasure for me to participate, even if only from a distance, in the IBA Vienna 22. Since we have a short time window, I will start with the presentation right away. I'm pleased to present you today the Tegel project. Uh, let's do the next page. Uh, okay. One of the biggest city development projects in Europe will be completed on the site of the former Tegel Airport. The state of Berlin had commissioned Tegel Projekt with the development and management. The total area of Berlin TXL, including districts and landscape park, covers a total surface area of five square kilometer. Among other things, the project will create 20,000 jobs in future-oriented industries, 5,000 students will be able to study there, up to 1,000 companies will settle there. We have three different new areas in Berlin TXL we are going to develop. The Urban Tech Republic is an innovation park dedicated to green urban technologies. Schumacher Quartier is a residential neighborhood pioneering the use of sustainable technologies and building methods. The residential district is to become a low traffic area free from individual car traffic with a new kind of public mobility. <laughs> and the third part is a huge landscape park. Berlin is growing and needs affordable housing. After the closure of Tegel Airport, a new smart residential district will be developed on its grounds. <clears throat> Schumacher Quartier will provide upwards of 5,000 homes for more than 10,000 people, together with the corresponding amenities such as uh, schools, daycare centers, shopping facilities, and lots of greenery. A further 4,000 homes are planned for the neighboring district of City Pasteur and takes El Nord. The new Berlin mix offers areas for housing, <coughs> retail services, and non-disruptive business activity. There will be more than 5,000 residential units of different types. 50% multi-story residential construction by state-owned housing construction companies, 40% various residential types <coughs> sorry, built by cooperatives and private construction groups, 10% student housing. In addition, there will be two schools as well as sports and youth facilities on an education campus. The range of facilities is complemented by six daycare centers. The Schumacher Quartier with over 5,000 apartments for more than 10,000 people is to become a model quarter for urban timber construction. But it is not only through timber constructions that the quarter is to become a pioneer for urban design. Other components play an important part. On the base of leasing land, it is possible to have a low exergy network. Berlin wants to be climate neutral by 2050. With an innovation combination of different technologies, 
Berlin TXL will be an urban laboratory for a carbon neutral city district. This low exergy network, as it is called, is operated at low temperatures of up to 40 degrees Celsius, compared with standard district heating with low temperatures of at times more than 100 degrees, the losses of the low exergy network are significantly smaller. Moreover, the low network temperatures now make it possible to use environmental friendly heat sources efficiently. New mobility concepts. A mobility revolution is underway with bike sharing, <coughs> electric vehicles and numerous other technologies offering new ways to be on the move. Schumacher Quartier will be largely car free in the interior. The cycling infrastructure will offer a high standard of safety. Wide bicycle lanes are planned, allowing easy overtaking or even cycling side by side. Junctions and roundabouts are clearly laid out. Two bicycle highways will cut through the project area and intersect in the urban tech republic. The most important transfer points between the various transport modes in Berlin TXL are called mobility hubs. <coughs> they make the switch from motorized individual travel to bicycles and public transportation more attractive. In Schumacher Quartier, the mobility hubs are located on the edges of the district and function as meeting points combined with a district garage. We are thinking about planning a drone landing site on the rooftop for delivery services. What does climate change mean for our cities and the people who live in them? Whether phenomena such as a torrential rain or extreme heat occur more frequently. Wherever roads are paved and plots of land are developed, water has no natural drainage routes. In heavy rain, drainage systems reach capacity more often and tend to overflow. On hot summer days, inner city air quality can become unbearable. Berlin's Schumacher Quartier takes a different approach to tackle this problem. The residential buildings and open spaces on the grounds of the decommissioned Tegel Airport are being planned as a sponge city. <coughs> Backwater is becoming Berlin's reference project for urban development, adapted to the climate and sensitive to its water needs. In the Schumacher Quartier, every drop of rain enters a complex cascade system that includes blue-green roofs to planted zones, fluid plains and underground buffer storage. All rainwater is used or stored in, the, in Schumacher Quartier. Nothing is lost. Animal edit design <laughs> is a property term of the landscape design. It is a planning method in which open spaces and buildings are designed in such a way that the needs of specific animal species are met. At the same time, the residents of the quarter are able to rediscover nature to watch a squirrel scrambling up a tree, or to hear the song of a skylark in the evening, experience like this convey a very special feeling of the quality of life in the very midst of the city. Experts have identified 14 promising target species for the Schumacher Quartier. Living conditions appropriate to these species are being created for them <coughs> in the adjoining landscape park on the site in the former airport. Consistent with, with biodiversity, it is to be expected that more species will become established in the quarter in addition to those targeted. On the next two pages, you will see images of the Schumacher Quartier to give you an impression of the design and the construction. The Schumacher Quartier at the former Flughafen Tegel area is to become one of the largest timber residential areas in Europe. Sustainable and future-oriented cities need a new form of building with sustainable, renewable materials. With upwards of 5,000 homes for more than 10,000 people, it is set to become a model district for four to six level social living area in urban timber construction. Why buildings out of timber are crucial to make our cities more sustainable? The idea of sustainable, affordable and attractive living spaces is only possible with innovations in the whole value chain management, forest to city, for the production of urban space. This enables the switch from a concrete-based method of construction 
to a more attractive and sustainable serial timber construction. And timber is the material we do have enough in the region of Berlin and his surroundings. However, the use of the Berlin forest is not only thought in the direction of timber construction. The forest must be converted everywhere in Europe. The monoculture is to be changed into a mixed forest in order to be able to respond to the challenges of the changing climate. The wood that is taken from the forest in the course of the conversion is available to the Schumacher Quartier. This allows us to create a regional value chain from tree to housing. We as the Tegel project have prepared a tender and are looking for an element manufacturer who will take over the wood from the Berlin forest with the standing tree. He will take care of the future processing of the pine and use it to create an element catalog for the timber construction for the Schumacher Quartier. In addition to the elements, he will also supply the structural analysis and all relevant details. The elements include wall, sailing and roof components. The constructor is free to choose whether to offer timber frame construction, skeleton construction or solid wood construction. The state-owned housing associations undertake to take over and install the elements. The advantage is to become independent of the daily timber market price and to be cheaper in timber construction. We have also developed a matrix that controls the use of wood in Berlin in order to simplify wooden constructions. Therefore, the city of Berlin has decided to organize a so-called future hut or Bauhütte 4.0 to organize the processing of an urban timber cluster. Future Hut makes Berlin TXL a hub for innovation. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak in front of you and present the project. Since I unfortunately cannot be with you, a colleague, Katharina Mach, will answer your questions at the end of this round. Dear Ms. Mach, thank you very much for this. Goodbye, and as they say in Vienna, Bussi und Baba. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Simon Wimmer, for, for your time, uh, in particular if it, when it's short. Um, timber construction is uh, already the, the key word also for our next presentation. Um, Schumacher Quartier, we, have two, we had Schumacher Quartier in Berlin, now we come to Prinz Eugen Park uh, in Munich, uh, where timber construction pl also plays a, a massive role. And we're happy to have Christiane Meyer with us from the Department for Urban Planning and Building Regulation in Munich. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Christiane Meyer. I'm from the Department of Urban Planning in Munich and responsible um, for su um, subsidized housing and housing on municipal land. I would like to briefly introduce to you how we approach the topic of redu reducing the carbon and material footprint through use of timber construction and how we assign city plots for this purpose. While doing this, I'll refer to our most recent project, Prince Eugen Park, where all these principles were applied. The city of Munich has a very fortunate location at the feet of the Alps and surrounded by lakes. Munich is also a very dynamic environment with a constantly increasing population, 25,000 year per year. The pandemic slowed down the pace. Unfortunately, we have less and less space, like <laughs> all of us. Um, to build housing and our highest duty is to ensure the development of sustainable and affordable housing. Um, the policy has set uh, the, the rate of growth upon which Munich should increase housing at 8,500 units uh, per year, out of which 2,000 units um, should be subsidized or price reduced. Environmental goals become increasingly relevant. The Munich City Council passed a law stating that by 2030, the city's administration will be climate neutral. The energy standard of city buildings must have the standard of a passive house or efficient house 40. The carbon footprint of used building materials must be controlled and considered. When technically possible, only renewable energy or district heating is to be used. 
the district heating provided by the municipal utilities should be climate neutral by then. The city believes it should act as a role model. Timber construction and uh, the Efficienz House 40 standard are criteria for plot tendering. Let's look at the development of the model settlement in Prince Eugen Park. The formerly Prince Eugen Barracks is one of several former ba barrack areas that the city of Munich was able to develop. Prince Eugen Park is located five kilometers northeast of the city center. In 2008, we launched a competition for ideas and the realization of urban development and landscape planning. The concept of Munich's urban development, compact urban and green, is clearly reflected in its design. Here you see the master plan of Prince Eugen Park, the model settlement in the south, uh, framed in red. The winning uh, design envisages a five-story urban development uh, in the west. In the rear area, there are so-called clusters with a variety of types of housing for different ages and social uh, classes. Um, you, I mean the area here. Also. City villas and apartment buildings. 50% of the apartments are in subsidized housing. The center of the new residential area is, here is, um, is a lively square with shops and restaurants. Other uses are a school, a community center, sales and service areas, and daycare facilities. Valuable biotopes, old trees and meadows give the site a park-like character. A further special aspect about the Prince Eugen Park is that all the builders formed a consortium that represented the interests of the further res uh, residents. Now there is a neighborhood cooperative. Now I come to an important basis for the model settlement. Before the property was tendered, important basics were laid down in a research project. We had a very successful cooperation between the Technical University of Munich, Chair Professor Winter, and the Ruhr University in Bochum with Professor Annette Hafner. For the definition of how much wood is used in a building, they developed the measure of Navarro's. Navarro in German, Nachwachsende Rohstoffe, Renewable Raw Material. The unit of measurement is a kilogram Navarro per square meter living area. In this work, a distinction was made between small and large buildings, type A and B. The reason for this is the stricter legal requirements for high, higher buildings, class four and five. The higher the building, the higher the law requirements. Next, next, I would like to explain our delivery strategy, the plot concept tendering, um, concept Ausschreibung in German. Our goal is high quality districts. There is no price competition. We do the plot award according to tender criteria. The best con concepts get the plot. This is how the tender works. It's a, it's a two stage uh, procedure. At the first stage, we spe specify minimum requirements that must be met. For example, a minimum share of Navarro's energetic criteria or eco catalog. At the second level, there are additional selection criteria. For example, a certain proportion of timber wood within the construction, a mobility concept, upper living space limits, community development and enhancing measures and so on. Um, you see here an excerpt of the tender materials. There are, for example, a maximum of 100 points in total, and we can see how the points are divided into. For exa example, here, um, efficient use of living space, here the ecological criteria, uh, and planning, uh, planning criteria. <coughs> There is quite a range of, uh, for ecological criteria. 
from the use of Navarros to usage of rainwater for gardening or sanitary uses, and even structural measures for animals like building breeders and bats. For the funding program, we had the city council resolution in October 2015. The total bu budget of the program was 13.6 million euros with the aim of funding additional expenditure on timber construction with a high proportion of renewable raw materials. The builders had to provide proof of Navarro's from sustainable management with recognized certificates or harvested nearby. Because the multi-story wooden housing construction was not so established at that time, we set up a quality assurance through an advisory board. Talking again about Navarro's, imagine you are a member in a cooperative who has no experience in timber construction. What does it mean if we make an offer with 200 kilogram of Navarro's? This overview can be a guideline. It is another result of the research work with which building construction was to achieve a certain Navarro level. See that here, top left here, are 50 kilogram Navarros. What has to be in wood is marked in brown. <coughs> you can clearly see if you go to more than 120 kilogram, almost everything has to be in wood. How high are the additional costs? How high is th was the funding? For the small houses, there were 70 cents. In case of apartment buildings, there were two euro per kilogram Navarro. In retrospect, after evaluating the funding, the funding amount worked out exactly. Why was there higher funding for type B? Um, the requirements for fire protection are higher in buildings of classes four and five. Here you have a significantly higher planning effort in wood than in mineral buildings. We come to the integrated planning approach. In order to ensure that the timber construction work, integrated planning was uh, required from the start. The builders have commissioned very well versed experienced specialists plus the planning teams were required to present their designs to a panel of experts, the advisory committee. With regard to timber construction, soundproofing and fire protection, the exchange was very good, the planning was very good and all projects were successfully implemented. In the model settlement, a total of eight projects were created with a very high proportion of rental apartments. There are eight individual timber construction projects from hybrid timber construction to pure timber construction with up to seven floors. In the photo, you see the completion of the project Little Prince, an owner cooperative, was celebrated by handing over the keys. Um, you see uh, our planning officer in the middle, Professor Elisabeth Merck. Um, a further research project of the Ruhr University Bochum accompanied the model environment, uh, the model development. It documents the implementation of the buildings and offers a comparative presentation of the results. However, the innovation of the ecological model settlements are uh, the implementation of a large number of envi environmentally relevant individual measures in the areas of so soil, water, biodiversity, open spaces, regional food supply and building construction across property boundaries in an entire quarter. The results were summarized in a book publication. In this way, the ecological model settlement is to be made known as a model project for other municipalities and development agencies. In addition, in the research project was shown how much carbon dioxide reduction is implemented by substituting more energy intense building materials. High energy standards and the use of district heating increases further carbon dioxide reduction potential. Furthermore, the building's carbon storage was calculated based on the building materials used. 
the model uh, settlement stores almost 13,000 tons of carbon dioxide in the, in the long term. Let us look to the recent development. The city council liked was what, what was created. Further resolutions on timber constructions were passed. Uh, for further information about Prince Eugen Park and the settlement, um, you can look at our website or feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Christiane Meyer. Uh, so these were two aspects of timber construction. Um, and we'll come back to that in, in the debate. Our next speaker is Ellie Green. She's already standing. Uh, city architect of the city of Dublin, and she has worked a lot about the question whether in certain cases to tear down and rebuild buildings or to retrofit it, and to calculate into, or, or to bring into that, those calculations the question how much carbon is already in, in embedded in the, in the material of existing housing stock. Welcome, Ellie. Um, thank you, uh, Johannes, and, um, and thank you for inviting us to participate, and uh, thank you for hosting this through English, because you're making our jobs a lot easier, myself and Dahi. Um, but uh, I suppose this is as much a progress report uh, as anything, because uh, the project I'm going to really focus the, the presentation on, and I'll lead you through the presentation towards this project, is actually a project that was, has almost grown up through our collaboration uh, with uh, IBA Vienna. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's lovely to actually share a positive story with you because you've been part of the making of the story. The, um, okay, Dublin City Council. Um, Dublin is a city's population of half a million people. Uh, Dublin City Council is the largest uh, residential landlord in the state, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we uh, own and manage about 24,000 social homes, which might not sound a lot to uh, in, in other contexts, but it's, it's significant in, enough in Ireland. About 11,000 of those homes are in flats, apartments, flats. And, um, and, that's, and that is, uh, has always been a little bit challenging because in Ireland we are only recently, in, in the last decade, two decades, have we started to become more accustomed to apartment living. So, um, many of our flat complexes are quite old. They would, um, they would have been built in the, from the 1940s onwards, 30s, 40s, and uh, they, many are in poor condition. Uh, uh, they have to be uh, retrofitted, they have to be deep renovated um, to NZ standard, everything has to be brought up to a certain standard by 2050, as, as we know. And, um, and so we have, uh, uh, not just for that reason, Dublin City Council has uh, prioritised audited and prioritised our flat complexes in order to determine how they should be repaired. Um, and it's also just as our responsibilities as landlords. Anyway, this auditing and prioritising has been going on for the last oh, 10 years and um, uh, we have uh, 26 priority complexes that are on uh, a programme of work, a works programme and of those 26 complexes, uh, three, three quarters are, are going to, uh, the plan is or was to demolish them entirely and redevelop the sites. Um, one of the reasons for that decision is that the issue of embodied carbon, whole life carbon, has not been part of our criteria, our decision making criteria. So, um, but that's maybe going to change, but an example of why our, our focus has been, until now, on, on demolition, an example is uh, our Dolphin House estate. Now, so you can see it's, you can actually, you know, it's, 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 it's outlined in orange. Um, quite a large complex for Dublin, 400 uh, flats, 
were constructed in 19, finished in 1957. They, they deteriorated um, the, over, over the years, although uh, repairs were made, they deteriorated to the point where the residents demanded that we refurbish them. Uh, so eventually, after quite a protracted uh, engagement process, it's a very, very, very uh, rich engagement process, uh, the, uh, there was an agreement to refurbish, and in 2013 we did a master plan, and the master plan essentially looked to, well, do phase one, but looked to actually retain many of the blocks. Um, these blocks were going to be demolished, and we were going to really try and restructure the estate to actually make, particularly around better public space. Um, uh, phase one was completed in 2018, um, a mix of uh, renovated apartments and infill new uh, apartments houses. Now, uh, we were very pleased with the outcome. The residents weren't so pleased with the outcome, particularly the residents who were in the refurbished flats, because they felt they didn't compare well to the new homes. There's many reasons for that. I can't go into it now. But also in, in the city council, we were, we were looking at uh, the decision making was cost, cost, cost. And it, it was felt that the renovations were so expensive because they also included amalgamating flats. So we say we, we took um, 73 existing, existing flats and we, crea we only created 100 new, new homes. So there wasn't a huge amount of gain high cost and um, and it it just was felt that the the gains in terms of the renovation didn't didn't merit this so uh, and the residents demanded a new master plan they said no we want the whole estate demolished so that's that's where we are at the moment we've done a new master plan that shows 100 percent demolition it's a cultural issue i think the word culture was <laughs> mentioned before but um look this is a story that's ongoing but um there are questions, I'm not going to read all these out. I mean, as this story has, has been happening, phase one was finished in 2018, we've been looking at our other, our other complexes. We're starting to understand or, or try to understand the whole, the, the issue of, of climate action, climate change, whole life carbon, the value of existing buildings. And we're also, we're also challenging ourselves in, in, in our own thinking processes. Um, and, uh, and through our work with the Irish Green Building Council, and I know there's a, a, a Green Building Council in Austria as well, um, the, uh, we, we're, we're starting to, uh, I suppose, uh, accept that we have to start measuring embodied carbon. We have to start assessing the whole life carbon of our regeneration plans. We also have to become leaders in climate action. We have to try and show the way to other, um, to other property owners who also want to, when they want to create, uh, uh, what, whether it's new offices, um, new homes, they, they think the first, the first choice is demolish and, and, and rebuild something, build something shiny. But um, we're also looking at this whole issue of maybe we're going to overstep our 2050 targets. I mean, when I look at some of the renovation projects, I mean, you might as well demolish the buildings so much, uh, the, the buildings are so, uh, uh, you know, interfered with and so many new materials are added that is it really retrofit? It's not really. Um, so uh, the question is, are we actually, uh, do we really need to deep retrofit everything by 2050 or will, is nearly good enough good enough? Um, it's, 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 they're, they're big questions. Um, so, this brings us to this project, uh, Dominic Street. Now, Dominic Street is another estate uh, in Dublin. Um, the story, okay, was built in the 60s. Uh, five, no, sorry, eight blocks. Three on Dominic Street West. Uh, five on Dominic Street East. The, um, again, the, the, the homes had been refurbished over the years, but they were, they were in, are in very bad condition. So in 2006, we decided to regenerate. Um, the plan was 100% demolition. Um, we're going to start with the first phase, Dominic Street East. Um, 
The blocks were demolished. It was tendered as a public-private partnership. The part, PPP collapsed in 2008 with the global economic crisis. Um, we did a new master plan in 2010. Um, and finally, um, fast track up to 2022, we have a wonderful new development complete on Dominic Street East, uh, 72 new apartments, a new community building, and a community hall. And critically, the residents in these blocks are going to move over here. So we're going to have three vacant blocks on one side of the street, and we've got a fabulous new development that's, that is NZEB and everything on, on, on the east side. So it kind of just begs the question, do we really have to demolish these three blocks? Uh, we did a whole life carbon study that was commissioned in 2020. That was a desktop exercise. We, um, well, we found out many things, but we basically found out that all of the, the carbon that would go into um, a, a new build, um, would, um, it would take 13 years to break even. You know, they, uh, it, it might be operationally very efficient, but it would, it would, we would use up so much, uh, uh, emit so much carbon in, in building new that, you know, are, are we really going to see the benefit? And maybe retrofit of these blocks is an answer. But of course, the problem is these blocks are seen as very ugly and they're stigmatized. And there's a, there's a, a cultural um, um, uh, distaste um, of, of, these, of these blocks. They're synonymous with poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, wouldn't it be better if we got something wonderful like that? Um, so there wasn't um, a lot of enthusiasm in Dublin City Council to retrofit them. Um, it was seen as a very valuable inner city site. Um, there's a good bit of land at the back. Maybe the whole site could be densified. But um, over the, and this was where we kind of came in with the uh, IBA Vienna. It was an idea. It looked like it was going to, that retrofitting would have merit. Then the answer was no. But I think the whole tide has changed in terms of our understanding of, of climate um, uh, change and, and, and the summer we've had uh, extreme weather events, there is just a growing appetite to, uh, to do something. So now actually there's a huge amount of enthusiasm to do something quite experimental with these three blocks. Uh, we have a very good climate uh, action plan coordinator, Sabrina Decker. Uh, Sabrina got uh, funding to commission to commission a digital twin project. I am not digital savvy, I, um, I'm uh, a Luddite. But um, if I can turn around to somebody in the Department of Housing and say, we're doing a digital twin of the three blocks in Dominic Street, and it has been funded by the Department of Public and, you know, Expenditure, Enterprise and Innovation or whatever, uh, um, and they go, hmm, that's amazing. Uh, so, the, um, so we're doing a digital twin of the three blocks. We're, we're, we're going to model four scenarios, shallow retrofit, medium retrofit, deep retrofit, or reduce to shell and core and rebuild. Um, we will use the outcome of that report uh, that should be finished in November, end of November. That'll help us prepare a brief um, in order to actually execute a project proper. I don't know what that project would be, but these three blocks represent an opportunity to do three different things, measure, test, learn, um, uh, disseminate the findings, and actually see which is the best uh, optimum retrofit approach uh, for Dublin City Council in regenerating our flat complexes, and maybe for the wider community uh, in the private sector when they have to come and, uh, and think about what they're going to do with their buildings. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie, for, for this update. Um, on that project that, that we are following since, since uh, a few years um, with the interesting aspect that not only the, the uh, CO2 emissions of new builds but, but also the embodied carbon is, is included in the, that kind of calculation and, and uh, thinking. Again, the final presentation of this round will go to Stuttgart. Um, this is again a conversion project and a redevelopment um, of the project Necker Spinnerei which, as you can uh, hear, is a, a former production site. Um, and we have Stephanie 
Kellein here, from, again, project manager from IBA Stuttgart. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for the invitation as well. And um, I'm going to present you one of our IBA 27 projects, the Neckar Spinnerei neighborhood. Yeah, in Wendlingen unter Boingen, directly situated at the River Neckar, lies a beautiful area, as you can see, um, of a former spinning mill of a local textile company. And uh, together with this company, which is actually the owner of the, of the area, um, we want to develop uh, this site into a forward-looking mixed-use neighborhood. And the combination of working and living was already taken into account in 1861 when the buildings were constructed. So our task is now to reinterpret and redesign this area. Um, here you, you see the site plan and the project area has a size of 4.7 hectares. And as you can see, there's still open space next to the uh, building stock. And so in addition to the preservation and transformation of the existing buildings, the construction of, of new buildings on the open space, and thus the connection between old and new in terms of architecture, materials, and also history, is uh, a, a place the major role. And of course, we hope, um, because we will host the, uh, the IBA in, in, in 2027, so we hope um, we can show also some um, buildings in, in 2027. The central approach in the process is to combine different sustainability topics into an overarching vision. And this is the basis for the design of the planning process and shall also lead into a so-called sustainability manifesto for future residents and companies in the neighborhood. And therefore, in the beginning of the planning process, we held several workshops to find a, a common vision. So what do we want um, on this area? What do we want to do with it? And um, we wanted to identify also specific themes and values um, um, regarding sustainability. And so we have all agreed on the common vision of sustainable living and sustainable economic activities. But the question is, of course, how shall this vision be implemented? Um, yeah, so we think um, via innovative and integrative addressing of topics and values like uh, you can see here, the transformation of the building stock into an innovative and sustainable neighborhood, um, but also uh, the circularity in the building sector and the use of sustainable and healthy building materials, um, the creation of a CO2 neutral neighborhood, the constant integration of all these sustainability aspects in the whole planning process, um, and a very flexible use neutral architecture that allows a wide variety of uses over the life cycles of the buildings. And we also uh, um, want to apply um, sustainable financing tools for the project development itself. So the focus is clearly on sustainable building and recycling in all its aspects. And as I mentioned before, the existing buildings will be preserved. Uh, density through new buildings will be created and the open space will be used in many different ways. So it's like to transfer the former mixed use into a future-proof version. Yeah, and to get an idea of what the building stock uh, can sustainably provide in the future, we had uh, three concept studies developed about new work, new housing and hybrids. And these concepts together with the, the visions and the sustainability criteria um, build the basis in terms of content for the upcoming international planning competition. But of course, we are also facing some challenges. Um, and tenants from the following sectors have already moved into some of the existing buildings. So we have a company um, which produces home textiles, there's a communication and marketing agency, and there are several startups um, of the field of um, ecological technologies. Um, and soon there will be also a workshop for the handicapped and an inclusion cafeteria. So they fit well um, with the vision, uh, but I have to say it was more a coincidence because the, the project owners um, still feel insecure 
um, on developing the sustainability manifesto. So it's, it's one of the criteria, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, and so this is some of the, uh, or one challenge that um, the economic thinking of the project owners is often more important than um, the sustainability criteria. And yeah, in addition to the, the studies and the vision, we want to use, for example, as you can see on the, on the right side, the green scenario tool in the competition in order to be uh, able to optimize the designs in terms of uh, climate adaptation, open spaces, and circularity of water and energy. And moreover, we realized um, that in order to implement this vision and all the mentioned criteria, it's essential to have a caretaker, somebody who pulls the strings, who controls the overall project management, and who doesn't lose sight of this vision of sustainable living and working. And this is the weak point at the moment, um, as there is still a lack of competencies in, in, this, in this area. But yeah, we are trying to, um, to build up a stable network and to overcome this, this lack. Yeah, and furthermore, at the EBA, we are currently working on a pilot project to implement circularity of the building sector in our EBA projects. So we would like to create a digital infrastructure that, among other things, um, allows the creation of digital material passports and also enable a digital uh, marketplaces for used materials out of our um, EBA 27 projects. And we are planning to use such second-hand materials also in the Neckar Spinnerei pro project. Yeah, and how to deal with building stock uh, as urban mining in general is an important task, but not less important is also the implementation of circularity in the planning process itself, um, especially, of course, for new buildings. So how can we build in a sustainable and ecological way with as little materials um, as possible and integrate demolition in a reuse concept from the beginning of the planning process. To sum up, it can be said this, that we as the IBA um, are trying to bring together a wide variety of sustainability criteria and we, we are trying to create synergies um, using the Neckar and other projects uh, as experimental areas. And it's also a kind of experiment to find out where the, the willingness in practice um, exists and where economic thinking still decides. So to a certain extent, we also see our role in education and we want to contribute um, to a change in awareness towards sustainable project development and circularity of the building sector. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for all those contributions. Um, you have together mentioned various facets of ecological um, retrofitting and ecological new building uh, or conversion projects, starting from the energy network, uh, the question of material circularity of, of material use, um, transport modes, and, and, and so on, many aspects. Um, there was one concrete question to uh, the makers of Schumacher Quartier uh, regarding the, the start and the end of the project, so what's, what's the time frame um, and the amount of trees that are needed for all that timber production. So I don't know whether someone from Berlin might answer these questions. I'm coming to you. Um, the time is... Um we tried to start the first phase of the Sch uh, Schumacher Quartier in 2026. That's what we are working for. Um, the last phase is, we have one last phase we are not sure we can build, so this is um, unless time now. We, have to we want to decide about the last phase in 2025 when we can see how the start is with the first phases. Um, but the whole development on the former airport area is now timed until 2042. This is our perspective for the development. Um, the amount of uh, the needed timber, I don't have the uh, um, 
I don't have the numbers uh, in my head, but I know that we have um, contractment with the uh, Berlin um, Forest um, Department, and they reserved um, an amount of the wood per, per, per year for the project, so we can build the whole uh, Schumacher Quartier from this um, Berlin-owned um, wood. Now we are in discussion with the um, living companies um, which shall use this for the buildings. And it's um, the discussion about the um, kind of elements they can use for the building. Thank you. Celia, you already were addressing the question of timber construction at the beginning. Yeah, so I, I w thank you very much, and I think it looks like, um, okay, I stand up. So, well, in, in any case, I congratulate you because I think these projects look very ambitious. Um, but my question is um, following up on the previous question. With the wood construction, um, um, you know, I would like to know if how the connections will be, if it will be reversible, if you will respect the circular economy principles, meaning that you shouldn't glue anything, but use uh, bolts and screws, um, because I think that's a very decisive factor um, in judging if it's really going to be sustainable. And um, also, you know, I would like you to comment on that World Wildlife uh, Commissioned study by the University of Kassel, which concluded that Germany is importing wood and that there's not enough wood for all these um, wood uses right now and that there are lo a lot of... I mean that recycled wood have to would have to be used much more, and that it's especially important that if you build in wood that it's reversible, which of course raises the costs. Um, so I mean I would uh, yeah I would really like to know um, more about you know how you're going to judge the ecological um, impact. Thanks. So this question goes both to Berlin and Munich and. I understood that it's 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 wood from from local production. Perhaps you can can add to this. We demanded uh, wood with uh, certain certificates or uh, locally harvested wood. So, but. Um, ah. <laughs> Uh, we, we did not uh, uh, make uh, requirements for um, the deconstruction of the building, but th that's our topics we are thinking of now. But we did not, not have implemented <laughs> by then. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I would just like to add that wood, of course, I mean timber construction would be ideally suited for you know reversibility much more than if you build with concrete so I think you have a very good starting point but we have to think of the future because I my big fear is 2040 is coming and and then you know 2038 suddenly people are realizing we are, we are not prepared enough so <laughs> perhaps I may add a general question to uh, regarding the, the circularity of ma materials, um, also going to, to Stuttgart, but all the others. Is there a chance to creating a real marketplace of, of uh, materials uh, that, that, that will function in the also in economic terms? Well, yes. I'm, I mean, we're all on a very, well, certainly in Ireland, we're on a steep learning curve. But, uh, for example, there's a very excellent uh, uh, organization called the Rediscovery Center in Dublin, which is uh, doing a lot of great work in, in, into the circular economy and uh, particularly bu and building materials. The Irish Green Building Council is doing a lot of work. It's almost as if we're, we're the, the whole pace of the the study, the research, the knowledge, you know, the, the knowledge building is, uh, is, has just accelerated. Um, all that, look, all I'd say is we can't really afford not to. And uh, I, I mean, I'm involved in so, and Dublin City Council, we're involved in so many construction projects. And I mean, <laughs> the, every day they get more expensive. These are the traditional ones. The traditional ones are ex more expensive every day. 
they are beset with problems. So even traditional construction and the old, the old ways of doing things are not problem free. So uh, as uh, somebody said to me the other day, if you don't want problems, stop building housing. You know, so so uh, construction is really complicated, and uh, and and when it comes to climate change, uh, again we've uh, again the Irish Green Building Council, they're a wonderful source of information for us in Dublin City Council, have established that um, that uh, uh, construction activity in Ireland generates as much uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions as our agri agricultural sector, which we see as our leading you know emitter but uh, construction is is so um wasteful and uh, that we don't have a choice but to find better ways of doing things thank you could you want to ask i had a question to munich about the navarros because you in the presentation you talked about additional costs and when you presented uh, 70 cent per, s per kilo and it's 50 kilo per square meter, so it's 35 euros per square meter, this is the funds or is it the additional costs? But because I think now I, I cannot believe that this is the additional costs. I think it would be more. Seventy cents uh, was the funding for the smaller building, and two euros uh, per kilogram Navarro the funding for the higher buildings in class four and five. Yes, but you have uh, but uh, but the the square meter is thirty-five euros per square meter. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that is enough to account? N no, a, a certain amount, amount uh, stays at the builder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a growing amount. A gro <laughs> <laughs> Celia? Um, well, I have a question to Ali Graham regarding Dublin. I really liked your presentation because you uh, displayed, you know, sort of the, the big, uh, how should I say that, the, the problems as well as the paths and the solutions. Well, I personally think, and, you know, we've been very much involved in the office and Alfred, my partner, is here too, with the circular economy topics for the l last years. And I've just been to Brussels, which wants to be the circular economy capital of Europe. And I think we come to the conclusion we cannot tear down anything anymore at all, period. Yeah, no more tear down. Now, there's a few exceptions, like you know, one-story buildings or really bad buildings. But the ones that you showed struck me as particularly beautiful, you know, and they're built out of brick. I mean. I mean, come on, you know, <laughs> Dublin. I mean, I think, you know, and the issue of beauty and the issue of, you know, the psychological factor, this is really interesting because we are actually involved in a research pro project in Vienna in an iconic vacant school building that is most hated, but it's mostly beautiful. And we find that there's so much psychology involved. And I think maybe, you know, to have like workshops with the residents, what is the real problem? I, I, it cannot be the building. I, I don't believe it. So, and also I think, of course, if they see a new apartment next door, it's like a new car and a used car. I mean, of course they would prefer the new building. So I think, you know, um, I would really very much like to get the results of your study when it comes out in November, because I think the embodied carbon, that's the way to go. If you look at that, then you cannot tear down these buildings, but maybe you can add to them or, you know, reorganize the flats. We are working with the university on buildings in Milan, and we found that very often the layout of the floor plans are just not appropriate to today's society. I mean, they're all these floor plans uh, are family, father, mother, two kids, so they're not working anymore for elderly people that live alone or for larger immigrant families. So sometimes it's a lot of you know thinking. So I'm making also a, a big advocacy for our profession, architects and urban designers. Maybe in the future you have to spend less money on building and more money on thinking. So thanks. <laughs> Um, yes, well, we, you know, absolutely agree with you. We, um, uh, we shouldn't, um, uh, you know, we shouldn't. The, the, it's like the the fashion uh, statement: the most sustainable item of clothing you can have is the one you already own. Uh, the most sustainable building is the one you already own. Uh, but 
um, buildings are so, uh, I, I don't think Ireland is unique. Buildings are completely, they're status symbols. So it's a cultural issue. And, uh, and when big corporations want to make an impression, they want a new shiny building. So it, it, it's, it's uh, every sector in society has to kind of change the way they're thinking. So I'd be reluctant to turn around to social housing tenants who've had to endure decades of maybe not living in ideal circumstances and say, you know, suck it up. Uh, it's, the cl it's the climate when everybody else around them is, is, is doing what they want, you know, in terms of new possessions and whatever. So... Uh, it's it's a sensitive issue. I mean, you know, we will we will work our way through it. Do Dominic Street, we won't be demolishing those blocks, and they will become wonderful. They won awards in their day when they were constructed. They won awards. Uh, they will win awards again, and we won't develop out back. We'll turn out back into sponge, not maybe sponge city, but sponge back of flats. <laughs> <laughs> and but uh, Dolphin House, we'll see. You know, you know, we've got to respect communities and, and, and what they've been through. Uh, they didn't make the problem. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> uh, but yes, but I, th I think there's a, there is, uh, the more important learning is actually in policy makers, uh, not expecting communities to just accept anything that's imposed. Policy makers have to accept that they have to pay to save uh, carbon. That costs money, but money is the least of our worries. <laughs> yes, thank you. I just want to add one thing, because we need two things. We need a change in mindset regarding reuse, um, reusing of materials, but we also need um, uh, other laws and regulations, or less of them, um, which makes it easier than to reuse materials and, and not to treat them as a necessary evil, because it has a lot of value, and this is something, yeah we need to appreciate. Thank you. There was a statement from Andrea Steiner. I, ha I have a completely different question. How did you get out, out all the people of the building? I mean, did you pay them? <laughs> yeah, I understand. But if I have an apartment and I like it, why do I have to go there? D usually, it's this is the position of our um, people. Yeah, but they pay the same or they pay more now? They pay the same for the rent now? Ah, okay, so it's completely the same. They just switch over the other side of the street. Okay. Okay. And the owner is the same of both buildings? Ah, okay, so it's a little bit easier. <laughs> we try to do the same thing, but it's... Uh, not that easy because usually you don't have the possibility to do the same. I mean, you don't have 100 apartments here and 100 on the other side. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I know that there are many more issues on, on that, but um, as al uh, Ellie already gave us the keyword of community, we will now go over to the last session focusing on community engagement, again with four short spotlight presentations, starting with Brigitte Scholz from Cologne um, and introducing to us the Korweiler uh, uh, district where there has been a, a large uh, community involvement process in this redevelopment. Thank you for giving me the floor. So it's this third presentation from Cologne and I give you another um, side of the city now. So we are going to a um, project uh, in the north of Cologne. So does it, no, this is the wrong thing. Ah, uh, it's just the wrong thing at all. So that's better. So we're going in the north of the city, and it's a development from the 1917s, after the, uh, or during the rebuilding of the city of Cologne. And you can here see the center part of the city, 
and uh, the aim was to build a second city. We heard about the digital twin. It's not a digital twin, it should be a twin of uh, our city. And the thinking was very ambitious um, to build a new city, and the new city, about 40,000 40, people, should be um, a new cologne for working and living there. Um, it was a good plan, but uh, in fact, it does not work. You can see it right here. Uh, it's uh, during the building of the city, the housing market uh, broke down, and we had a lot of uh, housing of people living there with uh, lots of problems. And since about uh, 50 years, we trying to give them a support to empower them, and we are still doing it. And I think we are doing it in the next years also. So we have an integrated program. We call it Starke Fedel, Starkes Köln. Starke Fedel is the same as Kretzel in Wien. It's our um, neighborhoods. And the neighborhoods is, should stay together and get engaged to make their surroundings on their own and also to solve problems on their own. This is the big, big aim in this program. And we invited uh, different measures in this program to neighborhood management, upgrade the public spaces, and also to use uh, or to, to give more security and something like this. And one of the biggest program is uh, the revitalization of a public space. You can see it right here, of course it's in winter times, uh, in summer times it <laughs> must have looked better, but you see there's no um, quality in these public spaces and in my opinion the public spaces are our uh, assets for the future in the city. We can do a lot with them and so we started uh, to think about it and we did it with a big um, process in inviting the people to be part of it. And it was financed by the uh, Ministry Nationale Projekte des Städtebaus. It's our um, federal ministry. And they give special funds for these special projects. And you have to really give a high quality in these projects. And so this was for us really a um, challenging way to get this process shaped. And of course, I've got to thanks Caroline Wagner and the urban development who did the planning process, we just did the funding of this process. And uh, the participation process was uh, very interesting. We invited an office from Berlin, Urban Catalysts, and they said it must be something very special in this place. So first they started with public city walks, and then they did this. It was some kind of alien coming into this place, and everybody said, well, what's going on? I've got to go there, and I've got to be part of it. And after that, uh, they started the normal planning process, normal, um, you can say, and then they did the design, and then we realized it. But just look at this alien again. The place station just came there, and then the people were invited to come there, and it was also some kind of testing what is going on there. Um, and the testing at the place station was uh, how could it be used as a stage for some musicians, but also uh, a central soccer field was laid out, and a giant jazz field, and one of the most important thing was this public kitchen. The people from the city itself or town part itself were invited to cook there and we have about 40 nations there living and so the people can come and do something with their hands for themselves and so they are getting engaged to to be involved in this process and to shape the process for their own not only participation but also i, I like really much more the word empowerment because participation is something from yesterday and we can't participate, we must engage the people to take the future in their own hands. 
And this was the design, the zoning plan that was developed and you see different colors. So it was different colors and different characters for these three places. And after all, it was the mayor cultural zone right here. It's the Platz, Pariser Platz. It's near uh, the, um, the town hall that is located right here on the church. Then we have here a multifunctional place. There's also a marketplace and a parking lot, a parking slot. And this is the Leona Passage. It's a more active place. So, and after that, they did the concrete design on this. It was an office on um, landscape architect from Hanover who did this. And you now see it, um, it's getting a little more, more normal, but if you see it now, you can recognize that the quality of the place has increased a lot. We spend about uh, 30 millions in these three places. We had only 5 million funds, so we had to convince our politicians that they have to spend some money on their own. But I think it's a really good effect to booster this place and to say that we can continue in this way to engage the people. And we, in the exhibition we show our new uh, settlement Kreuzfeld. It's just in this new town, Korweiler. And so we will build um, um, some kind of pathway between these places and the new settlement to combine these places together, not only living the new people coming there, but also the people, people already lives there. So thank you so much for this short spotlight. Thanks a lot, Brigitte Scholz. Uh, the next project that, is, that we show is from Berlin, Haus der Statistik, a project that we are following since the beginning of our cooperation and, and talks. Uh, and although it's about one building, it's the building is that huge, um, like like uh, a neighborhood in other cities. And Jonas Machleit from Berlin Senate will present it. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for the exciting exchange over the last two to three years. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jonas Machleit from the Senate Department of Urban Development and Housing from Berlin. And I will try to approach to give you some information about our project, House of Statistic, in about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm really sorry in between I have to skip some slides because there's a lot of slides. Um, but uh, I think we can make it work. So to give you an impression of the, um, uh, of the mindset in, in, the, uh, in the time when the House of Statistic project was developed, uh, I show you this graph. Um, it's oversimplified and uh, not to be uh, taken seriously, but uh, it shows um, the kind of situation that, uh, especially, uh, the center of Berlin uh, is facing at the time. So, as you can see here, the rents and the population is uh, going s uh, straight up, and uh, actually, the graph is just f flipped uh, on top side down. Uh, where we see that the spaces for affordable housing and spaces, spaces especially for art, culture, and social affairs is going rapidly down. But since we are optimists, uh, we always say there is hope. There is the house of statistic. As you can see, we are slap bang in the middle of the city. Uh, right here is Alexanderplatz, so very central area in Berlin with the Fernsehturm, and over here, you can see uh, the so-called Karl Marx Allee, uh, Zweiter Bauabschnitt, uh, which is basically a monostructured living area. And right between uh, those two areas, here's a lot of commercial uses, and right between in uh, those areas, we find the Haus der Statistik area. Haus der Statistik literally means what it says. It's a former GDR uh, administrative building built uh, from 68 to 70. And it's basically where the five-year planning uh, for the GDR was done. But um, uh, after the reunification, uh, the site fell to the federal government 
and there were plans in the 90s and 2000s to um, uh, demolish the area and uh, develop it by a private investor. For many, many reasons I don't have time to tell you now, uh, it, uh, didn't, um, it didn't came like that and the, the site uh, was basically empty uh, from 2008 on. Uh, in 2015, there was um, yeah, a bit of an, uh, a stunt from a group of artists and activists who uh, uh, show uh, this picture on the facade of Auster Statistik. And it's supposed to look like a building uh, uh, information, but uh, actually it is a demand from those groups, artists, <coughs> activists. So it's a little bit of a German wordplay, but for the English-speaking people, uh, you will now learn what the dots on the O's and the U's mean, uh, because it, it doesn't say gefördert, founded by, it says gefordert, demanded by. So those are the dots and they make a real big difference. But uh, since the, uh, uh, this action got very popular, especially uh, via internet. Uh, it had uh, instant support from the local um, district government, from the mayor of the district, uh, Berlin Mitte. And so uh, there uh, was a common sense of we need a new vision for this block. We need, uh, we need to create a common vision. Uh, and um, there were a lot of open network me meetings held um, to get to this point. In 2017, um, the city of Berlin bought the whole site from the federal government uh, since the new coalition was formed. It's a, cooperate, uh, a cooperation of five partners. We call it the Co-op Five. Um, so we have um, the city of Berlin uh, with the Senate department we have the district administrative, Bezirksamt uh, Mitte. We have two city-owned companies, the BIM, the BIM, the Berlin Property Management, and the WBM, the VBM, which is uh, also a city-owned housing company. And then our fifth partner is basically a legal form of the original initiative of the original activists. Uh, it is called the ZKB. Uh, ZKB, which translates to um, yeah, the Get Together Berlin, Zusammenkunft Berlin. So I will slip this. Um, the decision was made not to demolish the existing building, but actually uh, to uh, renovate the existing building and add other uses. So uh, as you can see here, uh, there will be about uh, 40,000 square meters for administ administration uses in the existing building, but also, especially here in house A, which is facing Alexanderplatz, there will be about 10,000 square meters for art, culture, social affairs, and education uses. And also, there will be uh, uh, houses added here and over here, where the flat buildings will be demolished. Uh, and we will add um, uh, yeah, square meters for housing. That, that translates to roughly 300 units. And also, uh, also spaces for art culture. And, uh, very important, the district of Berlin Mitte will have a new uh, city hall over here. And they also integrate um, our uh, art and cultural uses. So, I will now skip a few, just one note. We love compact, uh, complex graphics at House of Statistics. This is one of them. This is our um, uh, design uh, for um, the so-called Werkstattverfahren, the planning and uh, process uh, uh, competition we had, which was very much um, dialogue oriented and somewhat similar to Korweiler, it was um, and not about participation, it was about empowerment, uh, so the neighborhood were involved as well. Uh, I have a few graphics more of those, but um, 
I will not go into detail, I will just show you the results. This is from 2019 and it's basically the master plan to develop the area. Um, since we don't have the time, I will just um, uh, speak about one aspect of it and that is the ground floor area. So here you can see that uh, especially in the ground floors we put, in, put a special emphasis on uh, pioneer users as we call art and um, um, social users uh, and education users in the Hausser statistics, so pioneer users here. And basically um, those users make uh, the base for all of the other users. So for example here you can see the new city hall which has in the ground floor integrated uh, our pioneer users. You see um, the new housing area here, uh, which also has a base a ground floor uh, with the pioneer users. And the ZKB will also uh, build, um, and now, they, now it's three new houses, two so-called experimental houses, and one for integrated living over here. So. Um, the program of the ZKB will be uh, developed right in the center uh, of the quarter and um, uh, also the ZKB is supposed to curate those ground floors, basically to manage those ground floors. And this is uh, yeah, the, the basic idea and uh, what we're trying to do is um, yeah, to, to not only uh, initiate those ideas, but to um, to keep them on the site during the planning phase, during the building phase, during the actual building phase, and then in the use phase of the quarter. I will now again skip some slides <coughs> with some images of the planning. So everything that I said until here uh, is roughly about five minutes, but in actual time it took years and years uh, to, um, uh, yeah, to develop uh, the state that we see uh, today. So what was the approach of our so-called pioneer users? The approach was uh, start with what you have. So um, the cooperation was convinced um, uh, that uh, the opening of the ground floors while the existing buildings um, uh, were still um, yeah, gutted uh, basically or were still uh, not in use was very important and so uh, we opened the ground floors for our pioneers and we got um, up to uh, 6,500 square meters of free space in the center of the city uh, from 2019 on. Um, so we see here the ground floors of the existing buildings uh, and we had like uses like um, um, yeah, social initiatives that care for homeless uh, young adults living on Alexanderplatz. We also had an art cinema and um, over here in the so-called House G is the only uh, ground floor still active as a pioneer space today. Uh, uh, we have um, a reuse center. Basically, um, we have um, yeah, initiatives and, and uh, um, private people still also from the neighborhood that care about uh, reusing materials that care about upcycling materials. They uh, will give you lessons about how to renovate your sofa or your old uh, seat and you can also rent tools there. Uh, so the neighborhood is highly involved and um, yeah, we, uh, we think it was a very good idea that we, we tried to add to the idea of the reuse center. Uh, so in this, in this summer, uh, all those ground floors, uh, uh, the pioneers had to leave because the renovation of the building started. But um, well, first I will show you some impressions of what we did on the site within the two years that we had. Uh, so um, yeah, you can see how much life there is in this site that uh, was basically a no-go area since the 70s. 
Um, this is uh, also very similar to Korweiler. One central aspect uh, of our pine users was cooking. Uh, it makes it makes it very easy for people to get together and to learn from each other, and also, um, uh, yeah, it uh, uh, raises uh, it, uh, it demolishes cultural barriers from uh, people, especially uh, with refugee people. Um, it was a very yeah. A low key approach. We had um, international summer schools from universities here. Uh, we had the opening of the Berlin Art Week in 2019, which was really special. And here you can see some practical results of our reuse approach. Those are windows taken from uh, all the buildings on the site and um, yeah, basically. Uh, put together in a sort of uh, art installation within the Pioneer users. So uh, this is what we are doing today. Uh, we have the so-called Arbeitsersatzflächen, the so-called um, uh, uh, spaces for the Pioneers during the renovation time of, of the existing building. So. Here there's a, a big building site and all the ground floors um, uh, are empty now. But uh, we installed some, uh, some spaces over here, over here, and over here that the pioneers can use during the time of the renovation. And uh, also um, those spaces were formed with uh, reused materials that we gathered from the network of our reuse center. And there's another complex graphic, I promise you. Uh, what we're working on today is uh, how can we um, run the site when the construction is finished and how can we get the pioneers to be in, still involved and still able to um, use the site when the construction is done. So basically what we're trying to do is we have a foundation. Oh, this is actually um, not the final result, this is just uh, uh, what we came up uh, until today. So we have a foundation that will watch over the general ideas of uh, the uh, development of the, of the area. And then we have a so-called uh, Quartiers EG, uh, which is basically the, a non-profit company uh, that will run all uh, the ground floor areas for the pioneers and uh, the free spaces. So, <coughs> lastly, another German wordplay, uh, as you can see, uh, see here, on the top of uh, the house facing the Alexanderplatz, it didn't, doesn't say Alexanderplatz, it says uh, Alles Andersplatz, which sounds very uh, similar in German, but it means uh, literally um, a very different thing. Uh, it means everything different place. So, um, uh, that's not to be said that we want to do everything different, but we want to start basically um, with what we have and, and uh, take the initiative from the people um, and all the support from the people and, and uh, make something happen. So um, um, sometimes, although the boundaries are blurred a bit, but sometimes it's not how to integrate local initiatives but it is how to uh, get integrated into local initiatives, especially at House Statistic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonas Machlet, for, for, for this update for, uh, of the story and to see that um, this is following the principles from the beginning uh, and uh, good, good to see that. We are coming back to Doi Downey. Uh, who presented at the beginning the cost rental model and now will show an example of um, how this is working in practice uh, at Emmet Road. Okay. Uh, welcome back to Dublin. Um, so, uh, how's the energy in the room? <laughs> I'll try and keep this short. Of course, everybody says that and then we get carried away in explanation and it turns out not to be so short, but I will try and stick to what it says on the page, keep it short. 
What I'm going to try and do now is uh, pick up on some of the com comments uh, that you were left with from my colleague Ali and also some of the matters that have come out about how we are understanding the community uh, and also how we are engaging and indeed potentially empowering uh, communities. And what does that mean to us as a municipal provider of housing? Um, this is not a story about um, buildings that are in the process of being remade. This is a story about a place where there once was a public housing scheme, which has since been demolished, rendering a uh, greenfield site, which is sitting there today, uh, about to be redeveloped as a cost rental housing project, which will be the first municipal cost rental housing project. The ones I spoke about this morning are all uh, being developed in partnership with approved housing bodies and have a slightly different outcome, particularly in terms of their funding, but also in terms of their place making, because that's what this project has categorically got going that's very, very different. This is about a historic part of the city uh, in the, which one of these buttons is it, the red? There it is here. Um, you're, you're looking at a map of the city which is taken from our previous development plan which sets out the strategic development and regeneration areas of which St Michael's estate, the previous housing estate in here is one and those guiding principles were fairly standard and w very recognisable high quality vibrant mixed use urban quarters with streetscapes and civic spaces and so forth, balanced and sustainable communities, the type of language that is becoming quite commonplace but in terms of how it's realised then is the challenge. So, as I said, you're looking at a place which is effectively now a green field, but it's a green field full of memories, um, full of um, attribute and history, um, which is going to be a new home. Uh, and it's a long journey for all of the people who've lived in this area or the people who once lived in this area who are displaced or who have moved on, depending on your point of view. Uh, you can ask people how they feel about that. Some feel as if they want to return or say, no, I'm happy where, where we are. Um, but we're moving into a, a new stage to, to build this mixed-use neighbourhood with 500 or so residential housing units, 70% of which will be cost rental and 30% of which will be social rental, all of which is the responsibility of Dublin City Council as the municipal landlord, with a community uh, facilities, retail facilities, a public plaza, green spaces, and that's just at the beginning of this master plan. There's a lot more detail in there now about libraries and so forth. The master planning was uh, developed by Bolshoi's McAvoy Architects, and it's, uh, it's represented by that schema there. We've moved on from a whole stage of uh, analytical arguments and discussions about ecology and the densification of the site. The ecology is very interesting because the site is bordered by the Grand Canal, which connects Dublin Bay to the uh, River Shannon in the west of Ireland. Uh, the Camac River, which is a tributary to the River Liffey, uh, and the valley it forms here as well. Uh, and in between, this is the site we're talking about, there is this very large green space here, which is a cemetery today which was the first cemetery established underneath Catholic emancipation back in the 1800s, uh, opened by Daniel O'Connell and uh, has the right of sepulchre. I'll explain that later when I, when I have a chance, but taxing the dead is the quickest way to explain it, the right to tax the dead, in other words, to charge for a graveyard. Anyhow, uh, in there it's also uh, a very important place because institutionally there were uh, institutionally... Um, bounded um, provision for people who are uh, out of home or placed in poverty or single parents and so forth. So there's a lot of history in this area. The other thing that I found out recently is that this area is also used as a, um, a, a place to which raised the battalion that fought uh, against Napoleon in, the <laughs> in that conflict too. So there's an enormous amount of history in this place. Um, and it's also bounded by two very successful and well-established neighbouring areas, uh, the Bulfin Housing Estate um, uh, on the right and some public housing stock here as well. So it's very dynamic, it's very, very um, identifiable, uh, and it has in its master planning a densing and scaling right here in the middle where the new housing is going to go. So in explanation of all of this, we have to both curate and platform and engage and resource the process of engagement uh, and understanding uh, with the community who are existing, the community who are previously part of it, the extended networks of, of explanation required across them. Uh, one of the structures the city establishes is the Inchicore Regeneration Consultative Forum, a bit of a mouthful, 
but it's a forum that brings together uh, underneath an independent chair and a director with a staff secretariat, which uh, we talked about previously, the importance of continuity uh, that comes from that. It brings together established local groups, a number of community groups, uh, statutory bodies as well, local elected representatives, and its role really, as it says there in its own mission statement, is to facilitate the community to influence the proposed development in an inclusive, meaningful and genuine way. So it gets very much to the fore in representing the stakeholder engagement and that produces the opportunity then to resource the engagement through a dedicated um, programme. And that programme is, de is developed again through a third party called Connecting the Dots who are very vibrant uh, and engaging company um, set up specifically to try and draw in lots of different actors into a space across art, youth, accessibility, sport, education. That was their initial uh, categorization. And from that first round of public consul consultation webinars, a whole series of big issues came out. All of the big issues come out. So we were talking about a housing uh, model at one point, and then all of the big issues that we're, we're hearing about today come out. So we've got to the point where we're here at the end of phase three. And what I want to do in the next five minutes, if I can, is walk you through some of the direct feedback that we got from the phase three uh, consultation. Because the next stage is to go into phase four, and that's when, as I described it earlier to a colleague in the room, we go into the tunnel. And that's the final arbitration between the uh, National Planning Board, which will systematically evaluate our city council planning application. We come out of that tunnel with either a green light or not. It's as straightforward as that. So, the quickest way to put this forward, and all of this information, by the way, is available online, as I said earlier, and uh, make sure you get the contact. This is from the, the, the Connect the Dots uh, grouping. Uh, one thing that they did uh, that was very successful is they produced an online survey with a number of participants having developed all of those initial consultations. And this very simple question was, how do you feel about the project? And what's really quite striking about it is that I don't know was the majority feeling about the project. I am unsure about the project. There were some people who were just mm, not at all happy. There were some people who were very happy. There were some people who were, you know, somewhat happy, <laughs> which is quite somewhat happy. Uh, kind of, maybe I'm happy, maybe I'm not, I'm not sure. But the whole point of this is that the big thing is we're unsure. And so this talks about understanding what's going on, how it might happen, who's involved, who it's for, why here, why me, why now, all of that. And that dialogue goes back and forth. But in the main, it starts to distill and crystallise around key issues of height, density and tenure mixed in the proposed development, of safety and security issues in the area, impacting on traffic, on transportation, on planning. The project timelines, how long is this going to take, became a big issue. Management and maintenance uh, of the housing or the area in general is another issue. And then one I'll, I'll mention again and again, the request for additional information and updates becomes a substantial issue of people's understanding. So very quickly, let me just walk you through this. The biggest one, height, density and tenure. Some stakeholders say it's too high, others say it's not dense enough. It's as straightforward as that. The big issue is about density to address, to address a lack of high quality housing, a preference for taller blocks. So we have a big debate on whether density means height or whether density is, is achievable in a different form other than just height. The issue on tenure mix, because remember we're talking about a rental model here and the split between social and cost rental is disputed by some of the participants. Some feel there should be more social housing units because there's an acute unmet housing crisis in Dublin. But others are saying, hang on, there's a growing body of people, as we mentioned earlier, who cannot afford to live in Dublin in the rental market and who cannot afford to purchase, so what about them? So that's where that debate is. And then the justification of how that mix originally, as it's proposed, 70%, 30% uh, was arrived at, was also questioned, and some more information requests there. And the typology and the breakdown of the size of the units, one bedroom or two bedroom, one bedroom or three bedroom, to facil facilitate families. So that dominated a lot of questions as well. Safety and security, another ongoing concern in the feedback and the consultation, and people questioning whether or not the project would address the existing problems with crime and antisocial behaviour in the area, and whether the design of the scheme would actually uh, create or offer uh, 
uh, improvements in safety and security issues uh, or would actually add to the current problems. And this belies one of our broader challenges in housing, that housing takes has to take responsibility for a whole host of other issues, which is not directly attributable maybe to the design or the functional use or the carbon embodiment or so forth uh, in any one particular, but it's about where it's placed, how it's working and its relationship to the community. And it also addresses a point that Ali had, had raised in the cultural psyche in Ireland about what form of tenure is attributed as good or not good, as you mentioned in terms of it strikes you as a beautiful building made of brick, but it reminds other people of failure and perhaps a concentration of stigma uh, in a particular area. So they want, in other words, to remove that reminder, which is physically removing the building, which is not addressing the structural challenges, but it's symbolically making a change. So that's where that d debate of safety and security comes out in something that hasn't been built yet. Impacts on traffic, transport, parking, of course, these would be much more to the fore in terms of there's already a lot of congestion in Dublin. It's pretty chronic traffic in Dublin at the best of times. Then it rains. Uh, but, uh, and then everything com comes to a complete halt for an hour or, or more. But there was generally a positive engagement around changing the mobility as an impact of reducing the number of cars per household and also talking about the new methods of mobility and whether um, that can be created in a way that's successful and, and near future dependent. Um, while also addressing the issues that some people will obviously need to access private transport in some form for either employment or mobility issues, how that can become about. But in, in relation to the residential car parking spaces, it was felt that this might even add to the problems of traffic congestion in the area. So it was interesting to see how that debate moved. So that debate was much more about how well we're living outside of our home as we're moving around and moving through it, not so much about um, the security issues. Now this is one that was always fascinating to me because management and the maintenance of a place is crucial to its ongoing success, but also to the, to the way that people perceive and the, the desire that they have to remain or to move to an area. Um, and the future management and maintenance of this new space was, was, was queried by stakeholders. Can Dublin City Council, if it builds this wonderful new place to live in, can it continue to ensure that it will stay uh, a wonderful place to live in? Because after all, it has failed uh, to do so in the past. So there was a lot of um, uh, challenges that come out of this form of engagement, which re resurrect many of the de debates and many of the challenges of previous failures in the overall provision of social housing. Uh, in the city. But again, with that failure, uh, there are attributes projected back on to the City Council, which were not necessarily the City Council's responsibility, but became part of the history of the place. Uh, and the, this was the idea of learning from the mistakes of the past, looking to examples of well-established management models used in other similar developments. And at the core of that is concern about how that management model comes forward and what its costs are. Finally, this was the request for additional information and updates, and this is probably the, the most brittle area where key stakeholders are not actually able or available to share information at certain stages in the process, because as I said, we haven't gone into the tunnel, we can't say for certain we're going to get the proposal through. And this has created a, a feedback which is about the bigger issues about power in, and engagement in communities and who does have uh, that final uh, responsibility to be accountable uh, through decision making to local communities. Other things that came out overall were broader challenges around antisocial behaviour, some of the rationale for changes to the public transport system, what's going to happen to existing facilities, what's you know, going to happen, for example, uh, in terms of unit mix and the housing type, and people became quite engaged then in the design and specification of the housing. And then the potential for the use of roof space in the development, although I'm not sure yet whether we're going to get a swimming pool on our roof space, but we might get something on the roof space nonetheless. So after that final stage, that's stage three, the same questions were kind of brought back. So there's been some change in the community response from this sample. Now again, all the social scientists in the room know that this is proportionately just a, a pocket sample. It's not fully representative, so take it with a very large pinch of salt from that point of view. But in other terms, the success of the consultation mechanisms that have been deployed have removed the very unhappy group, they seem to have wandered off into some other category of happiness or misery depending on how they're expressing it. They're either very happy or very unhappy, uh, or unhappy or happy or still not sure. But the number who are not sure is also decreasing as well. So there is some 
heuristic here that says that we are having some improvement in the dialogue, that we're having some outcome, but it's still, from my point of view, still very fuzzy. You can't rely on this type of evidence to say it's done now. Because what we're talking really about is what comes next always. And that dialogue needs to be open, participatory, empowering. It has to be about resourcing people to ask the questions again and again and again. We're now at this last stage. We go into the application to onboard Planola, our national planning authority, adjudicator for the local authority uh, planning system. And during this phase, all other third parties can send in an observation. This is when it becomes really interesting. This is when all of the other parties who've been watching this emerge from their uh, bunkers or their shadows or standing in full daylight they tell you this is why we don't want it to happen or this is why we do want it to happen. One of those uh, uh, really interesting moments, so following the lodgement of, of our planning application, all of the submissions and observations made by interested parties will also be made directly available and you can uh, find a public notification system on that and you'll be kept informed of that and that's where we're at today. So thank you very much for watching the space. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, the, the final spotlight pr presentation is, will again be um, an outlook to IBA 27 in Stuttgart. We ask again Stephanie Kerlein to present it. It's Backnang West. Uh, redevelopment process, uh, which will be one of the key projects of IBA Stuttgart. Thank you. Yeah, in the last couple of minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about another project of us, Backnang West Neighborhood. Um, yeah, Backnang is a town with approximately 40,000 inhabitants, roughly 30 kilometers northeast of Stuttgart. And here you see the view of the historic center. This historic painting shows that the project site is characterized by buildings um, of former leather industries, mo most of which are still standing today, but are used on a rather small scale. And here is the, the project site itself and the ownership structure. Um, so you see that the, or well, you, know, you can't see it, but maybe you can estimate it. Uh, the project site is around about 17 hectares in the west of Backnang's old town, and we want to create this site uh, into an urban and productive neighborhood with areas for culture, production, industry, education, commerce, and dwelling, of course. So our main focus is on implementing the aspects of the so-called new productive city. And um, currently we are trying to develop um, a mixed-use concept for it. <coughs> One of the challenges lies in the complex ownership structure. Uh, you can see the different colors here. In addition to the city, uh, there are four private owners with whom we are luckily in a very close exchange. They have committed to our IBA 27 ideas and um, we are currently supporting them in the development of their first building projects. Yeah, in the run-up um, to the urban planning competition and in the very um, beginning of the, of the planning phase, we try to design an unconventional participation process that brings together the two parallel worlds of citizens and experts and accompanies the, the planning phase in a participatory manner. So first, a public workshop with citizens took place where input on certain topics uh, was provided in small working groups. At the end of each workshop, a citizen representative was elected to present the results in the following expert workshop. Um, we worked on one topic per month and held the expert workshop around a week after the citizen's workshop. And the four dip uh, different topics were mixed use and density, new forms of dwelling and neighborhood, public space and mobility, and innovative buildings and sustainability. In addition, we try to encourage a broad cross-section um, of, the, of the citizens to participate, and we spread the call via print media, social media, internet, schools, clubs, and associations of the town. At the end, we held a public closing event um, at which all the results were presented again, and a summary of the content of the citizens and experts' work was implemented into the tender of the subsequent international urban planning competition. 
Um, we were really glad um, because the format was uh, very well accepted. The citizens really appreciated the insight into the experts' work and the experts took the content of the citizens' workshop as an important starting point for their discussions. In the beginning, the workshops were attended quite well with about 100 participants. The number dropped during the process uh, with about 50 citizens at the last workshop. We also noticed that it was almost impossible, of course, to reach every part of society, besides mostly elderly people and those who are politically interested, um, just a few pupils, families, and people from a different cultural background participated. Yeah, and the next step was then to um, develop um, also um, quite creative and at least for us in the town, innovative planning process. Um, so yeah, together with the municipality, um, we started an open international call for ideas. So we did not ask for any references, just for one page, which shows that the motivation for the project um, was very high and, and visible. We received more than 100 submissions from all over the world and um, selected 18 teams for the urban planning competition together um, with six teams that were already um, seated previously. The results of the public um, participation were included in this call as well as in the tender for the planning competition. We presented the results of the competition to the citizens in an exhibition but um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, it needed to be digitalized. And it was really sad because, I mean, a digital exhibition is not the same as a physical one. Here you see the concept uh, of the winning office, and it consists of a productive and um, livable urban neighborhood with high density, with social diversity, and a sustainable mix of uses. And what is special about the design are the, the gray buildings you can see. These are the existing buildings and almost all of them will be preserved. And each color here on the plan um, stands for a sub area and each sub area has a different focus of use with housing being represented everywhere at almost 50%. Some of the themes from the citizens workshops uh, are reflected in the design. For example, proximity and liveliness in the neighborhood the beautiful open spaces and the access to the, to the river. And the area is divided into so-called productive courtyards. In German, uh, they call it here Mehrwertsockel. Uh, the, the ground floor zones become visible. High ceilings allow a variety of uses and you can see from the inside what is taking place here, uh, from the outside, sorry. The courtyards are accessible and invite people to stay. And yeah, the aim is to strengthen the identification with the neighborhood. In addition, we want to combine various uses also in one building, so in the vertical sense, um, create synergies and thus offer the future residents short distances in the area and a diverse range of offers. And yeah, but the sticking points uh, we are currently discussing is how to deal with noise and uh, private spaces. Next summer, um, our first IBA festival will take place as an interim presentation. And as we have not been able to involve the citizens of Baknang in the last two years because of the pandemic, but also unfortunately because of a very late assignment of the, the winning office, we want to take the festival as an opportunity um, to continue with the participation and to discuss the issues and opportunities of the project together with the citizens. So we will soon start developing a participation uh, concept for this, but it must be said that an overarching participation format um, that accompanies the entire planning process and also beyond is still needed. So this is really our main task for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all the contributions. Um, this was quite a dense program. Still, uh, I would like to give the opportunity to ask questions, uh, also to raise questions that you have already noticed, uh, noted. Uh, Celia, your writing 
No, not <laughs> any questions from the audience. I found it very inspiring. Uh, one question to uh, Jonas Machleit regarding um, uh, the Haus der Statistik. If I understand studio correct, um, the the initiatives that originally uh, were, were active in, in, in the Haus der Statistik are now not only involved as, as users of, of, of future users, but also involved in the planning process as, as stakeholders? The short answer is yes. <laughs> um, and uh, the long, well, a little bit longer answer is um, what we try to do in the cooperative of five is uh, to, to keep an eye level to all the partners. So we're basically uh, making all the major decisions um, together. I have a short follow-up question. Um, were these activists and artists um, squatting illegally there in the beginning or was it all in, in the legal area? <laughs> Again, the short answer it, uh, is it was a gray zone. Uh, and if you want to be really formal, it, the initial um, stunt was illegal. Um, but uh, as my colleague from the ZKB told me, uh, they um, had to go to uh, the police station and the officer there, uh, it was the one with the uh, building helmet you saw in the picture, uh, the officer said uh, formally the the action was illegal, but uh, he uh, feels very um, positive about what they're trying to accomplish. So, um, at house, especially at house statistic, we always get away with uh, some kind of gray area situation. Fine. Um, as we are ap approaching the end of, of today's program, but not really reached the end, uh, we, we are still um, waiting for another highlight, which will be the evening lecture by Lisa Peterson. Uh, I would now um, go into a, a break, um, right on time, in order to, for you to, to get some fresh air, uh, or some drinks, or a cigarette, where's Amila? <laughs> um, or whatever you need, and I'll ask you to be back here at, at six o'clock for the final lecture. Okay. See you then. Thank you.